All right, everybody, welcome back to another video. Today, we're gonna to talk about controlling your fermentation temperature and discuss some various techniques that you can use to do that. If it's your first time here, I just wanna say thank you for checking out my channel and welcome. Uh, here on this channel, I'll typically either do a grain to glass video or I'll do a different video on various topics in home brewing, like the one you're watching right now. If you like either of those things, please go ahead, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and stay tuned for more content like this. Fermentation temperature control is one of those topics that's kind of like water chemistry. It's once you start to implement it, it makes a world of difference in your beer. And I'm a firm believer that actually fermentation temperature control is probably the single best thing you can do to improve your beer. So here we're gonna talk about five different ways to manage your temperature control for your fermentation so that you can have the best possible fermentation and obviously then the best possible final beer that comes out of that. Method number one is probably your poor man's temperature control and that's just using the uh, kind of overall ambient room temperature to try and uh, keep your fermentation temperature steady. So if you have a thermostat that controls the temperature inside of your abode uh, or wherever you are fermenting, then that's basically your primary option there. Uh, while this method basically costs you nothing, it also kind of comes with a couple caveats and a couple warnings here. Number one is that your room temperature is probably going to fluctuate during the day regardless. Then the natural temperature changes outside are going to subtly affect the inside of your house. But number two, um, even with a thermostat, there's going to be some degree of variance and fluctuation within that. That thermostat does not always measure the correct temperature, uh, so just keep that in mind. The other thing is that the inside of your fermenter is going to probably be about three to five degrees hotter than the ambient room temperature simply because of the exothermic activity of fermentation. Yeast kick off a lot of heat and uh, fermenters are pretty good at trapping that heat. Kind of a variation on this is brewing with the seasons. So if you have a room that maybe borders an outside wall that's uninsulated, you might actually see relatively steady high temperatures during the summer and relatively steady low temperatures during the winter. That might allow you to do things like brew with quake or saison strains during the summer and then brew with maybe like English ales uh, or even if it's you know the middle of deep winter, you might be able to even pull off some lagering. It's not a very precise way of controlling temperature, but your results are gonna be way, way better than if you just fermented everything at room temperature because that's just not the answer. Different yeasts are gonna do different things at room temperature, and knowing which kinds of strains you can actually ferment at room temperature versus which ones you can't is uh, kind of important. Method number two is gonna be our first actual control system, and that is simply getting a chest freezer or a refrigerator, hooking that up to a temperature controller like an ink bird uh, that you can use to maintain a steady temperature. These work really, really well if you have the space for them. Um, unfortunately, I don't actually have experience with this because I have a smaller apartment and I already have a keezer. So um, I kind of prioritize the kegs over the fermentation because I have other methods that I use to control the fermentation. I'll talk about those later. But the chest freezer method works very well if you have the space. Because of the high insulation levels in it, you can actually trap a lot of heat from fermentation in your chest freezer, or you can even place a small heater in there to heat the fermentation if you need to. On the flip side, of course, if you have to cool the fermentation, well, it's chest freezer. It's pretty easy to do. Pretty much a foolproof method. Just don't go out and actually buy a brand new chest freezer. You can almost always find them used on Craigslist or eBay or something like that. So uh, just save yourself some money and do that instead. The next method we're going to talk about is a heat exchange system. The concept of a heat exchanger is quite simple. You're basically taking the heat from fermentation and you're either dissipating it out into the air or you're using some sort of evaporative cooling to exchange the heat for cooler temperature. Uh, one of the best old school fermentation temperature control techniques that uses this uh, concept is something called a swamp cooler. And basically what it is, is, you take your fermenter and you stick it in a bucket of water and uh, you cover it with a towel or a cloth or something that covers all the surface. That towel soaks up the moisture from the water around it, but then you take a fan and you point the fan at the fermenter. The heat for the fermentation gets transferred into the damp towel or whatever is covering the fermenter and the fan cools it off. Just like what happens when it's a hot day, you're outside, you're sweating and you get caught in a cool breeze. It's exactly the same principle and it works remarkably well, especially if you live in a hot climate. Now you're probably not gonna be able to lager using this technique, but it is definitely uh, still one that is out there for people who don't wanna spend a ton of money um, and can keep an eye on their fermentation. You might have to change out the water every so often, you might have to change out the uh, wet towel every so often, but it works pretty well. There's also a product out there that uses this sort of technique called the Brew Jacket Pro. Basically what it is, is a jacket that fits over your fermenter to insulate it, and then there is a huge heat sink at the top 
uh, that dissipates the fermentation heat very, very effectively. And you can actually get this thing to go colder than the ambient room temperature around it, uh, supposedly. I've never used it. I've had it recommended to me a couple times by people, so I thought I would throw that out there as an option. If you have experience with this system, please uh, talk about it in the comment section down below. Let us know what your uh, thoughts are. The next technique I have is what I use all the time, pretty much now, to control my fermentation temperatures. And that is using a heating and cooling system with a pump. This comes in varying price points. The most affordable one is the Anvil cooling system, which I use with my Anvil bucket fermenter. Uh, that comes in around $100. And uh, there are far more expensive ones out there like the spike cooling system that I also own and use with my spike conical fermenter. Both of these use pretty much the exact same principle. Basically what happens is you take a steel coil of some sort and you immerse that into your beer as it's fermenting. There's an inlet and an outlet on that coil that basically feeds in cool liquid that feeds cold water or cold glycol in one side exchanges the heat of fermentation through that coil and pumps out the warm stuff back into a reservoir of some kind. So if you have a glycol chiller, this is how that works. Uh, but if you don't have a glycol chiller like me, you can get away with using ice water in a chest freezer or a dorm fridge or something like that. I use my old mini fridge from college. I drilled a couple holes in the door, ran some lines through that, and I keep a bucket of ice water in there for my fermentation. I change out the ice every few days and make sure the lines don't freeze, and uh, it's worked out pretty well for me. I've had one situation where it didn't work out very well, uh, when we linked that video up here in the corner. The beer was okay at the end of the day, but the chiller failed on me because the lines froze. So if you're using a water system, um, you can, there's a couple options. You could actually use real glycol mixture in there if you want to, or you can add salt to the water to uh, lower its freezing temperature. But like nine times out of 10, that system has worked beautifully for me, and I just haven't gotten around to changing it up too much. Uh, both of those systems are very capable of fermenting lagers. I can get down below 50 50 degrees on them if I want to. They're pretty capable and I use them for pretty much every single fermentation that I need temperature control on. And that leads us into our final method of temperature control, which is actually kind of a trick because it's not actually temperature control. It's getting around the problem of temperature control by choosing your yeast properly or pressure fermentation. If you don't know what it is, pressure fermentation is taking your fermenter, uh, assuming that it is safe to actually apply pressure to, and adding about five to 15 PSI of pressure that is controlled by a spunding valve and a pressure relief valve. What that extra added pressure allows you to do is raise the fermentation temperature way above what is recommended for that particular yeast. It's a very popular way to make lagers because instead of dropping it down to 50 degrees to ferment like, at lager temperatures, you actually are gonna be able to ferment it just fine, 75, 80 degrees uh, with applied pressure. What it does essentially is prevent the yeast from producing fusel alcohols and other off flavors that would be associated with fermenting at too high of a temperature. It's extremely effective, um, but on the flip side, you're also going to mute pretty much all of your yeast expression, which is why it's really good for lagers, but not necessarily so good for all ales. It does, however, benefit New England IPAs, since it also traps in a lot of aromatics that would otherwise be lost during fermentation. It's very affordable to get into pressure fermentation. My recommended fermenter for pressure fermentation is a Firmzilla All-Rounder. You can get that for about 50 bucks. But also you have the ability to just kind of tailor your yeast selection to your fermentation temperature for a lot of things. Nowadays we have Quike, which is uh, a fantastic way to ferment at high temperatures without having any sort of off flavors again. Quike is a Norwegian farmhouse yeast basically that can ferment at very high temperatures all the way up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit in some strains, and it will ferment clean, or it will give you pleasant fruity character, um, depending on the strain of quike that you choose. So if you have a hot climate, or you're brewing uh, a beer that needs to be fruity, or a beer that needs to be clean, you can play with different quake strains and ferment them very hot, and with no temperature control, or with added heat if you want to, um, to get some really great results with it. Now, Quake is an awesome solution for fermentations in a hot climate, but you never hear anybody talk about a very cold climate. And as a New Englander, and somebody who lived in an apartment in Massachusetts that had almost no insulation in it, thanks landlords, and would actually never get above 60 degrees in the winter no matter how high I cranked my heat and no matter how much my electric bill cost, I had to get creative with yeast in this situation as well. Now, there's an option to use a heat blanket most of the times. So you could do something like that with most fermenters, but you could also just use yeast in a more appropriate way. In this type of situation, you can use English yeasts. 
English yeast love to ferment around 60 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit, but they get a little weird when you get a little hotter than that. Um, but you'll make great New England IPAs like this one. You'll make great English beers. You can use that English yeast in a variety of other types of beer styles as well. Another great option is to use the Kolsch strain or the German ale strain. Uh, those like to ferment in the high 50s to low 60s, and you can make a variety of great clean beers using those yeasts. Another great one to throw in there for clean beers is the California lager strain, uh, which is a great yeast as well. But of course, you could also just get a heat blanket and warm the whole thing up if that's your thing too. So the whole point I'm trying to make with this video is that you have a ton of options before shelling out $1,000 on a glycol chiller. So don't feel like that is the only method or even that that is the best method because honestly it may not be for you uh, in your situation. Hopefully this video gave you a bunch of different ideas to help control your fermentation and get better beer at the end of it uh, because that's what it's all about and that is really going to make a huge difference for you. If you enjoyed the video and you learned something, please hit that like button, hit that subscribe button as well, please buy a t-shirt for my merch store to help support the channel if you like that sort of thing too. Also, if you want to support the channel on a more personal basis, I also have a Patreon. That's linked in the description. Patreon supporters are awesome people and they're helping make big differences for this channel. Uh, I really am thankful to all of you for your support. If you're interested in some home brewing equipment that I recommend, I have an Amazon store linked in the description box as well where you can pick up a whole bunch of useful gear and things that I personally have used myself and recommend uh, from that store if that's interesting to you as well. I'm also available on Instagram as the Apartment Brewer if you want more frequent content updates than YouTube. And if you're still here, you either are watching all the way to the end or you forgot to click out of the window. But either way, I really do appreciate the watch time. It does matter quite a bit and you have my thanks. So until the next one, cheers. <laughs>